There's no doubt computers are here to stay. They're not a passing fad. In fact, more computer power is available to more people than ever before. There's an old saying, power corrupts, and that's true even with technology. The power of computers is colossal, and used wisely, it's certainly beneficial. But mistakes can still happen, and when they do, they can be very costly. In fact, there's a new and rather ugly phrase coming into our language. It's computer-assisted bankruptcy. Well, this program will show you what the microcomputer can do for you. And it'll do more. It'll show you how to make the correct choices and point out some of the pitfalls to avoid. Now, we'll be concentrating on the practicalities. We'll only get involved in the inner workings when it'll lead to a better understanding. The program is split into four units. They are the basics, why computerize, how to select, and specific applications. It may help to use a car as an analogy. The basics will cover the functional parts of a system, like the accelerator, the brakes, and the gear stick. And we're going to show you how to select and drive a computer, not how to build one, though. We'll use just enough of the jargon to help you through the slang you get from salesmen and computer magazines. We'll teach you the computing equivalent of brake horsepower, time from 0 to 60, and engine capacity in liters. Then we'll move on to the very important question, why have a computer in the first place? Next comes the difference between A to B motoring, motocross, and Sunday driving, and the importance of selecting the correct solution for each problem. And finally, we'll dive right into specific applications and problems which the computer can help you with. And we'll end with a look at the future. Now, the first question that must be answered is why should a computer like this be of importance to anyone? I mean, computers are not new. They've been with us since the Second World War. Until now, though, they could only be afforded by large companies, and they used to occupy a whole room. But now, children can buy them, and many are even portable, and some can even be as small as that. But I have more power in my hand than used to be contained in a whole room. Now, there have been many improvements over the years since that one was built. The first computers, such as the ENIAC, relied on many thousands of valves. It's a valve, they used to glow in the back of the old wireless sets, remember them well. But they had many drawbacks, especially in size, cost, and the amount of heat they gave out. Now, the first major step forward was the introduction of the transistor, this tiny three-legged component. They reduced size, cost, and heat at a stroke. It's this little gadget which allowed the computer industry really to take off. Now, the next step forward was not a major change in technology, but one of degree. This black beetle-like object is an integrated circuit, and it contains the equivalent of many thousands of these individual or discrete transistors. So it's fair to say we're still working with transistors, but they are minute ones. It's this integrated circuit which has knocked the old valve on the head once and for all. It replaces a whole roomful cheaply and gives off virtually no heat. Now, this beetle itself is not the integrated circuit, it's only the carrier. The circuit, the actual chip, is inside, held in the plastic, and it's even smaller. Now, this is how big it is, and it's tiny. If you magnify it several hundred times, it begins to look like a map of New York from the air. It's just thousands of tiny transistors etched into the body of the chip itself. Now, it looks desperately complicated. In fact, each of those tiny transistors can only be in one of two states, on or off. Now, there are many types of chip designed for all sorts of different functions, but they're all based on this same principle, on or off. But the chips are only a part of the complete computer. Now, that is the graphic layout of a computer's innards, but what does it look like in real life? Well, here is a computer in real life, and I can show you. That largest chip there is the central processing unit, or CPU, as it's usually called. It's normally one of the largest in the computer. Now, that is the computer's brain, through which all the instructions of the program and any calculations are carried out. Now, that smaller chip there is the computer's permanent memory, or ROM. Now, ROM stands for read-only memory. That's because it can't be written to, and so its contents can't be changed. Now, this group of chips here 
the little ones, are the other part of the computer's integrated circuit memory, the RAM or random access memory. The name doesn't give much indication of its function, but that's the read and write memory, and being able to write on it makes that type of memory volatile. If you switch the power off, the contents are lost. That's why we need some sort of lasting store, and that's where the disks come in. The well-known floppy disk drive it fits into slots like that. That is a floppy disk. Now, it's coated with ferric oxide, the same sort of stuff as cassette and videotapes are coated with, and it can be recorded and played back. In this case, they store data and not sound or vision. Those then are briefly the inner workings of the computer, but we also need ways of getting information in and out of the system, and that's where the so-called peripherals, the screen, the keyboard, and the printer come in. We'll be talking about printers more later. But disks all serve the same basic function, the storage of programs and data, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Now, the first of the floppy disks were the eight-inch ones, that size. Then came the five and a quarter inch ones, very popular now, and both of those are very easily damaged and they need separate cardboard covers. You should always put the cover back on whenever the disc isn't in the disc drive to keep the dust off it. And this three and a half inch disc incorporates its own cover. There's also a totally sealed storage disc called the Winchester, and that's it. You can see it's got quite a heavy metal case to keep moisture and dust out. Now, users of home computers can save the still quite hefty cost of disk drives by storing their data either on a perfectly normal domestic cassette tape or on Sinclair's new microdrive, which really consists of a continuous loop of very thin tape, as you can see. Now, in all the disk-based systems, there's a ROM which starts the disk and loads the program. Some machines even have programs in the ROM to test the system before you start. Here's an example. Those are known as the diagnostics. Now, home machines and other cassette-based types without disk make even more use of the ROM, using it to store the basic language. Going back to our car parallel, the CPU is the engine of the computer. It comes in three main capacities of 8, 16, and 32-bit. Now, I'm afraid we're forced to interpret some jargon. There's a bit, spelled B-I-T, and there's a byte, spelled B-Y-T-E. A bit is the single transistor switch, which has only two possibilities, on or off. And that's the basis of the binary number system, from the prefix by, meaning two, like bicycle, which has two wheels, or bifocals, which have two kinds of lens for each eye. Now, having an on-off system of numbers may be fine for a computer, but as human beings, we use letters in both upper and lower cases, and numbers in the form of naught to nine. So the computer had to as well. That was achieved by grouping bits together, just as the decimal system can represent large numbers when they're in groups, so can binary. A group of eight bits makes one byte. The old system of units, tens, hundreds, and thousands is pretty familiar. Each column goes in multiples of 10, so a sequence of two, one, two, three, we all know means 2,000, 100, and 20, and three. The binary system works in multiples of two, or integers, if you're into that sort of thing. So there are ones, twos, fours, eights, and so on, up to 128. Each unit is either on or off. So, for example, a one in the ones column and zeros in the rest equals, obviously, one. Lower down the chart, a one in the ones column and a one in the fours column equals one plus four equals five. 1 plus 4 plus 16, and zeros in all the rest, make 21, and so on. With that system, you can cover any number from 0 to 255 on one byte. 255 is with ones in all the columns. In the computer, the total of 256 is enough to cover the alphabet, both upper and lower case, numbers, and punctuation. That's 2 multiplied by itself 8 times, 2 to the power of 8. The power of 10 gives you 1,024, or 1K. The power of 16, 64K. And 20, 1 megabyte. Now, screens come in many shapes and sizes. The two main types are monochrome and color. The monochrome ones give a choice of single colors against a black background. 
It's white, green, or amber. It's a personal choice, so try before you buy. Now, there's a wide range of printers to choose from, one for each niche in the marketplace, from cheap to expensive and low to high print quality. But there isn't necessarily a direct link between cost and quality, because speed also enters into the equation, just to complicate matters. At the cheap and cheerful end of the spectrum is the thermal printer. Now, until recently, these had to use special heat-sensitive paper. I'll show you what that means. As you heat it, it turns black. Now, notice it did it without any sound, and that shows the sort of mixed blessings that this type of printer brings. It's virtually silent, but it has to have this special paper, and the paper has a very poor feel to it. There's no comparison with quality letterhead, and it's expensive. But machines like this, the Brother HR5, have kept the quiet operation, as you can hear. But they're able to print on normal paper by using a special thermal transfer ribbon. There's the cassette of it, and there's the ribbon at work. Now, the thermal printer is just one type of matrix printer. It gets its name from the way in which the characters are made, from a matrix of dots. Now, the matrix printer this time relies on actual contact for its print, and it's called an impact printer. Now, the impact printer is very fast, but it makes a terrible racket, as you can hear. A thermal one is silent, but slow. And matrix printers produce good characters, but not the highest quality. The winner on that score is the daisy wheel, and this is the important component of it. On this wheel, at the end of each petal, is a fully formed character, as you can see. Now, the system's not very fast. Most average around 40 to 50 characters per second. The fastest is only 60. The hammer hits a petal on the rotating wheel, and then, just like a typewriter, it whacks a ribbon, which in turn transfers the ink impression of a character onto ordinary paper. But unfortunately, once again, there's a penalty in the form of noise. You can do something about the noise by putting it in a more or less soundproof box, and that makes a big difference in a busy office. Now, the improbable-sounding inkjet printer has possibly the nearest quality to the daisy wheel for office use. It's quite extraordinary, but it works. What it does is spray the characters on the paper with a computer-controlled jet of ink droplets, and it does it quietly. The laser printer doesn't burn the image into the paper like the brand on a cow, as you might expect. It works on a similar principle to that used in the photocopier, except that it uses a computer-controlled laser to create the image rather than light reflected from the object being copied. And that's the sort of result you can see. It's very similar to a photocopy. The main advantage is very high speed and the ability to create virtually any image. Now, you can see from this table the comparisons between the various types. After that, it's up to you. Now, the computer's operating system is in many ways like the human subconscious nervous system. It carries out the day-to-day -day complex but mundane tasks. You don't need to keep telling your heart to beat, for example, nor are you aware of coordinating every leg muscle when you run. All you're aware of is the appearance of the bus while you're still 50 yards from the stop, and off you go. In the same way, when you load a program, you only need to tell the computer what to load. You don't have to tell it to start and stop the disk drive and go and find where the program is. The computer knows it needs to do those things, and so the whole process is automated. But that's only part of the story. There's one really frustrating problem with computers. All programs will not run on all operating systems. Now, in practical terms, that means that a businessman's accounting package may only run on one type of machine. Home computer owners may see adverts like this for the latest and greatest Space Invader game, only to find it doesn't run on their machine. The situation is like the videotape market, with three systems competing for your favors. If you have a Betamax machine like this, for example, you can't run a VHS tape on it. It just won't go in. The same applies to a VHS machine which won't take a Betamax tape, and the same with Philips and so on. They're just not compatible with each other. Now, that's no problem with popular films, which are available on all formats, but more unusual or early releases may only be produced for one type. Exactly the same applies to computer software, and for the same reasons. For that reason, you need to check what programs you're most likely to use before you choose your computer. 
Now, we've been talking about software and programs, but what exactly is a program? Well, I can show you a listing on a screen. That is a program. And they can come out as long as this. This is a listing of a program designed to tell you how fast your disk drive is operating. Now, they are the tangible representations of a program. Now, the dictionary defines a program as a sequence of operations to be performed by a computer and the coded instructions and data for those operations. Now, that's a very cumbersome way of saying it's what tells the computer what to do and how to do it. Now, writing programs can be absorbing, if you like that sort of thing, but the vast majority of people want to use their computers as a practical tool and not as a hobby. Now, if you are interested, there are plenty of books and computer programs on the market to show you how to do it. Now, the programs we were looking at were written in a language called BASIC. It's one of several high-level languages, each of which has a particular aptitude for particular jobs. This type of machine received its instructions hardwired in the form of plug, cable, and switch throwing. Now, that was a laborious process performed by lab-coded operators, but over the years, things have changed to make programmers' lives easier. The development of high-level languages like BASIC, COBOL, and FORTRAN has made it possible for us humans to talk to computers in something like English. All the computer really understands deep down, as we've said, is noughts and ones, so-called machine code. Now, this is what a machine code looks like. You can see it listed there on the screen. I mean, it's just a succession of noughts and ones. It's absolute gobbledygook to us poor humans, just a succession of noughts and ones. Now, there are a few masochists who can write programs in machine code. Nought one, nought one. They say it's a way of communicating, losing as little as possible in the translation. But most programs are written in high-level languages. For anyone who wants a specialized program but doesn't want to learn the skills necessary to do it from scratch, there is another option, a sort of halfway house. You can get a thing called a program generator. It produces applications in response to a question and answer session with a user. Now, these systems are aimed at both the expert and non-expert programmer. The expert often uses them to generate the bulk of a straightforward program, only resorting to writing the tricky bits by hand. Now, even computer programmers make mistakes. And when they do, the computer jargon for it is bug, which isn't far off what they say when they make one. For example, it's easy to confuse naught with capital O. That's why the symbol for a naught, the figure naught, has a line through it. The O is just a circle. Other errors are usually caused by the human logic and the computer logic not quite matching, because computers demand absolute precision. Now, what are computers really good at? Well, they're excellent at performing clearly defined tasks like accounting, information retrieval, and that sort of thing. Until now, they've been very bad at visual or audio recognition, particularly the cheaper ones, but there have been giant strides, and some are already in use. Now, there's still a big question whether to have a computer or not. Now, you need to look at what you're now doing manually and look for potential areas of computerization. Once you've decided on the areas for automation, then investigate the types of hardware you need. It could well be a number of different but compatible systems. And don't put things off forever thinking things are going to get better and cheaper. They will, but they'll carry on doing so and you'll never make up your mind. Once you've purchased the system, get on and use it. Forget the hardware search for a while, otherwise you'll be endlessly looking with envy at the latest piece of fashionable technology. When you do eventually outgrow your system or find that all the latest developments in software are not being offered for your system due to its antiquity, then is the time to change. Now, the price of data is one of the very important costs that you shouldn't overlook when budgeting for your system. When you buy your computer, it's empty and needs filling with data before it can do any work for you. The contents of this filing system, for example, have to be selectively and carefully transferred and catalogued for the micro. Now, that takes time and a great deal of money. However, once transferred, it's worth its weight in gold. You'll suddenly find you can get material out of the files faster and more selectively. And another word of warning. Other extra costs which are often overlooked are training, maintenance, insurance, furniture, and consumables. Now, they're not food and drink. They're paper. Paper at 0.75 of a penny for every sheet you use. Discs can cost anything from two pounds to five pounds. Ribbons are between one pound and ten pounds each, so costs can soon mount up. And don't try and save a few pence and compromise quality. A day's work lost for a 50 pence saving on a disc is not, quite clearly, a good investment. 
Now, contrary to the idea of the paperless office, computers seem to generate vast amounts of it. Now, many an expensive installation has floundered because of inadequate training. Now, training can take many forms. There are books, formal courses, and video and computer-based training, CBT, that's called for short. Now, computers can and do break down, and always, always at the worst possible moment. And there is something you can do to avoid disaster. If you've got only one machine and it's in constant use, then a radio call-out maintenance contract, which costs about 12 to 15 percent of the purchase price, is a good investment. But if you have a number of machines, all of the same type, you can usually switch to another machine without too much hassle. The computer system may well be the most expensive part of your office, and it'll naturally increase your insurance premiums. To get the best out of computers, you need special desks like these, and that's another cost. Now, once you've purchased your system, there are a whole host of add-ons, some of which, unlike the go-faster stripes on a car, can provide real benefits. Increasing your computer storage, for example, is one of the most popular expansions. It often results from finding that the computer can do more for you than you originally expected. It also lets you buy a smaller machine to start with and expand when funds become available. Extra RAM memory like this can be added to enable the computer to run some of the more sophisticated programs now appearing. This one will carry half a million characters. This one, 85,000 characters. Modems, this is a modem, can be used to allow communication over telephone lines to other computers. This one is permanently wired into the computer and it just plugs into the telecom system with the normal British telecom plug, the ordinary one that the phone plugs into. Or there's the acoustic coupler, which connects the telephone handset to a couple of soundproof rubber cups. And away you go. Now that opens up vast possibilities, some of which we'll be covering later. The availability of Prestel and other databases has resulted in increased modem sales, which has produced massive price drops. Now, if communications are of particular interest to you, some machines actually include internal modems. Now, this is a printer buffer. I'll tell you what it does. Computers can send out information more quickly than most office printers can handle. The computers are capable of sending out around a thousand characters per second, or CPS, that's the computer jargon for it. The slow daisy wheels print speed ranges from only 12 to about 60 CPS, and the fast matrix about 160 CPS. So there's an obvious bottleneck. The main problem is that with many programs, while the computer is printing, it can't do any other jobs. So the solution for many machines is this, the printer buffer. It's in fact a large block of RAM random access memory, which takes in the data as fast as the computer can send it. Then it feeds it out to the printer at a rate at which the printer can handle it. The larger buffers, this is quite a small one, the larger ones can store up to two and a half hours of printing for the slower machines. Now, in many offices, the printer is an underused resource. It's not very cost effective when you consider that a high quality daisy wheel can cost much more than many micros. So to get the best from your investment, Printer sharing among a number of users by manual or automatic switching is often best employed, and that's done by something as simple as this switch, which isn't very different from the switch you get on your hi-fi switching between loudspeakers. Printer 1, printer 2, printer 3, and so on. Now, the number of jobs a computer can do is enormous and growing all the time. In education, for example, computers can be used to teach you more about computers. They can also be used to teach other subjects. Unfortunately, in schools, the computer is often in the maths or physics department, and programming seems to get the greatest emphasis. Well, that's changing, and quite right, too. In the real world, very few microcomputers are needed to perform mathematical applications much above the level of a glorified calculator. The higher maths functions of many machines would rot away through lack of use, if that were possible. Now, the importance of programming is overstressed. What's far more useful is the ability to operate and select prepackaged programs. The jargon word is packages, like these. They usually come in the form of a manual and a disk. Now, computer buffs love talking computer jargon, as you've probably discovered. And one of the things you often hear is CBT and CAL. And they stand for computer-based training and computer-assisted learning. Their great advantage is that, like a real teacher, they're interactive. They go at your speed. And one really useful example is typing, because we're still lumbered for the time being with the old 
QWERTY keyboard, so we might as well buckle down and get the best from it. And the computer can make it a wonderfully painless lesson. Here's an example. It's just a disk, put it in your disk drive, and the computer does everything else. Now, an often asked question is, what's software? Well, there are two basic types. The package, an off-the-shelf solution to general problems, just like the off-the-peg suit, and custom-written software, just like bespoke suits, like this beautiful one. Now, the analogy between suits and software is actually quite valid. Off-the-peg software is cheaper, immediately available, but it's unlikely to be a perfect fit. Custom software, on the other hand, is expensive, often up to ten times the package cost, and it takes time to specify and write. But if everything is planned properly, like this lovely suit, it'll fit perfectly. Now, for general purpose applications, such as word processing, virtually all solutions are packages. Even with accounting, unless you're unusual or you can afford an exact match, you'll also go for a package. Writing your own software for complex applications makes as much sense as tailoring your own suits. But with the use of a program generator or a package called a general purpose database, I'm sorry about this jargon, but there is an awful lot of it in the computer world, as you've probably realized already. We'll be getting onto databases later. The important thing is that your own specific applications can be catered for. Now, when you start looking for software, you'll be amazed by the price range. The reason is that several factors are involved. If the software package is to sell in tens of thousands, the unit cost of the consumer is bound to be a lot less than if it's only going to sell in hundreds. And some software is more complex to set up and support, so it's priced higher to provide the dealer with a decent profit margin, understandably. Now, probably the biggest headache of all is trying to get more information. Before your search can really begin, you need to find your route maps. Books are a good source of general background, and magazines are ideal for more up-to-date developments. Videos will provide the actual moving images of the software and the hardware in action. Directories from bookshops or mail order will help you find out what's actually on the market and may well prevent you reinventing the wheel with custom software when a perfectly good package already exists. Now, what type of computer do you need? That's the first decision you need to make before looking at any specific hardware. There's a wide choice. You're not looking for a specific machine at this point, but simply sorting out which type is best for your needs. Well, this is a simple home computer with little in the way of business pretensions. It's ideal for learning about computers and playing games. This one we've loaded up with a flight simulator, and uh, it's wonderfully realistic. There's uh, the flight instruments at the bottom of the screen and a horizon, that's the sea and that's the sky, at the top of the screen. And you have flying controls. I can bank the plane to the right and level it out again. Or I can give it a little bit of down elevator and see what happens. Well, the true portable is a battery-operated machine which will operate anywhere. Now, these are ideal for both the executive on the move and for collecting data, like stock-taking or sales invoices. Now, for the executive, a battery-portable computer offers many features. It's capable of running the same software as dedicated office machines, a real boon if you have both types of system. It can communicate with its big brother in the office and to electronic mail services. Back at base, where power sources are available, it can run disk drives and a full-size screen. Appropriate portable printers have been developed to suit such machines, but some, like this one, have their own built-in printers. This one will print quietly and quite quickly. You can leave a record of a transaction with a client, for example, or you can even do some simple word processing with it. Now, the transportable differs from the true portable because it has to be plugged into the mains. This type of machine is ideal for those who work most of their time in office-like locations, but who also need to transport the machine fairly regularly. If you take your machine home each night or at weekends, for example, then this may be the solution. Be careful, though. When you're getting a screen to go with it, a small one is handy to carry around, but it's not always easy to use. And try the weight of prospective machines. There's a great deal of difference between one you can just about carry from the office to a nearby car, as opposed to one which is comfortable over a long walk. Unless, of course, you want to combine word processing and weight training. The Sinclair QL only weighs one and a half kilograms, and yet it has a capacity of 128K. That's as much as many bigger desktop computers. And I've just remembered, a few moments ago, I was flying an aircraft, and I put it into a nose down, oh, Lord.
you crashed into the ground at a speed of 263 knots. Ouch. Actually, I didn't feel a thing. Well, the next size up from the transportable is called the simple desktop computer, the FX20, for example. Or there are more powerful ones, like this, the future FX30, which contains a Winchester hard disk as well as a floppy disk store. And it'll take up to 40 megabytes. It has a 16-bit processor and a high-resolution screen. It's a great benefit to the serious business user. Well, in an office where several people need to use the same computer at once, you'll need what's called a multi-user setup. And Claire is one of our multi-users today. Welcome, Claire. The maximum number of users is the most important factor you need to think about when you're buying such a system. There's no worse situation than finding you can't accommodate all your users. So make sure you have enough room for growth. The main advantage is the ability to share storage and common resources, such as printers. That means that once you've got a reasonable number of users, it becomes cheaper than individual systems. The savings are particularly dramatic if a large communal store is required, which would be impractical to duplicate for each individual user. But remember, other people are on the system, and data must be protected from corruption and unauthorized people looking at it. That means a sophisticated operating system, such as BOSS, with levels of access and password protection. The system is also more vulnerable to breakdown because if the central unit fails, all users are out of action. And that can't happen with the single systems. So let me ask Claire, first of all, what are the benefits of, uh, of multitasking? The main benefit is that two or more people can be doing different things using the same computer but on different terminals all at the same time. And what about multi-users? What's the benefit of that? Multi-user means two or more people using the same program from the same computer, different terminals, doing the same functions at the same time. What happens if two people want the same information at the same time? Then the software takes over and tells you that somebody else is already using that particular record and will you either wait or try again later. If in the meantime the person who is using that record has finished, then the screen will clear and you can carry on with what you wanted to do. Well, the network is a happy mix of two technologies, the single user and the multi-user. Each individual has a single user machine capable of all the normal functions, but also with access to shared resources, such as large disks and printers. Now, to help you choose the best computer system, I've tried to categorize the machines into neat pigeonholes, but there are large overlaps. These new micro drives, for example, have added a great deal of portability. Now, a 32-bit machine, which has the power of many desktops, fits under your arm. Now, the systems we just talked about are possibilities. There's no absolutely perfect system. But you're now pretty close to being able to choose the ideal setup for your particular needs. This is the range of microcomputer hardware. There's a route you can follow which will help you make a success of your computing needs. First, pick the type of hardware for you. Then, pick software to go with the hardware. Then, select a dealer. Now, we've dealt with the hardware, so let's look at the software. The margin on low-price software is small. You can't expect days of dealer demonstrations for a £150 package. On the other hand, good dealers will welcome a client who's thought out his requirements and put them down on paper. The demonstration should be used not only to test out the computer system, but also the expertise of the company with the package and their general ability. Ask for the names of previous customers and ring them up. If a company has no satisfied clients, just go somewhere else. Ask for confirmation in writing that the software does what you want it to do. Then, if it's clearly unsuitable, you have some recourse under the Sale of Goods Act. On delivery, you should expect the system to be set up and proved to be in full working order. Now, you may see adverts for heavy discounts, but if discounts mean lack of support, and they usually do, then unless you're an expert, stay well clear. Now, should you go to a software consultant? Well, the use of a truly independent consultant can be of great use if you simply want a solution to a problem, but you don't want to get deeply involved with the search. What consultants do is cut through the jungle of possibilities. There are all of 140 word processing packages, for example. He should be able to give you a list of two or three. So here's how to choose your software. Write down your needs, arrange a meeting, assess the suitability of the software, hardware, and the dealer, 
Get and contact some reference sites similar to yourself. Get in writing confirmation of the software and hardware suitability for your needs. Arrange a maintenance contract if you need it. Arrange the delivery and proving of the system. And lastly, make sure your copy is a legal one. We've talked about the selection process. Now I want to explore some of the more common applications in a bit of detail. There are packages for almost every conceivable application. This National Computing Center directory has about 4,000 of them. And there's a wide variety. Accounting, you'd expect. Accounting invoicing. Very long section on accounting. Bakers, pub stock, construction, contract costing, news agents, operating systems, program generators, and so on. There's everything from the very general to the very specific. We're going to look at some of the more general and more popular applications. Just as a food processor makes the life of a chef easier, a word processor can be a boon for writers of all types. That's probably a deliberate pun. But just as it's simpler to slice a single onion with a knife rather than getting out the food processor, a short note is quicker using a typewriter. A word processor scores by allowing the maximum of editing with the minimum of retyping. Now, almost all microcomputers in office environments have a word processing facility of some sort. Some of the more advanced packages have most of the resources of the dedicated systems. Word processing packages fall into two groups. The first one has a charming acronym. WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is what you get. That means that the screen image will be very close to what will finally be on paper. Microprose WordStar is the best-selling one, and this is what it does. It can see a word being typed over the limit of the right-hand margin, so it'll look back along the line to the previous space, cut the line off, and move the overrunning word to the beginning of the next line. The system can be told to justify the lines to get both the left and right hand margins even. It does this by inserting extra spaces between the words in a line it sees is too short. The system performs both these functions while text is being typed in. Once text is in the system, it can be further manipulated. Characters can be deleted. Words can be deleted. Whole lines and even blocks of text can be deleted. The system allows an operator to overtype to insert characters, and to center headings. Even to move blocks of text around relative to one another. The same can be done with columns, and the program will even lay out a column of figures so that the decimal points all fall in line. There's a search and replace facility which allows the operator to define the word that appears in the text and instruct the system to find where this word appears and then replace it with another. And that's a WYSIWYG system. The other is the formatting type. Now, this formatting ability can be part of the program itself, or it can be an add-on. Star Index, as its name suggests, offers an index on screen. The formatting is done by commands. You don't even see the raw text on the screen. It's just a matter of telling the system to run a piece of text from its memory with a format from its memory. The format may dictate that headings are emboldened or underlined, that paragraphs are numbered or lettered in, say, lowercase a to z. Subsections are set out in Roman numerals or what you will. At the same time the program is doing all that, it'll make up a table of contents and an index. It does this by spotting and pulling out words from the text that have been flagged or highlighted when the text was written. There, you can see at the bottom of the screen, the system is counting up its section pages and also counting up the number of pages. And there's the total of index entries. In fact, the system creates three WordStar files. One for the text, one for the contents, and one for the index. But because with this program we don't see what we get, we have to go back to WordStar for a look. And there's the text, beautifully laid out with everything numbered and headed by the system. There's the table of contents, complete with the location of everything. And there's the index, laid out in alphabetical order. Now, one of the main benefits is well-presented and correct reports. 
Another equally valuable add-on is the personalized mail shot. And this is one of the most popular, mail merge. In this demonstration of mail merge, we'll call up from the memory a piece of text which has the variable bits of information missing. What we see on the screen is the program asking us to supply the missing variables. And armed with those few answers, the computer comes up with this complete letter ready to be printed off. I can see now why, in their letters to me, Reader's Digest used to refer to the entire cell family when there was just me and the cat. Now, once the words are stored electronically, many more options are presented, such as a spelling corrector. That's the job of another add-on, Correct Star. Correct Star has two dictionaries. The first is a 65,000 word lexicon which comes with the program. And you'll be pleased to hear these dictionaries now come with English rather than American spellings. And the second is a personal dictionary made up of unusual words and names that the operator uses. The system compares every word in the text with the two dictionaries and any word that's not recognized is offered for the operator's attention. But the program doesn't stop there. Working phonetically, it'll offer up suggestions as to the correct spelling. At the same time, the system offers a choice of actions, all available at a single keystroke. The word can be replaced by the suggested word. Another suggestion can be sought. The word can be added to the personal dictionary. The word can be ignored, and so on. And that's a demonstration of the WordStar professional group of programs. If you have a great deal of letter work, then automatic paper loading with sheet feed like this is a good investment. Now, moving from words to pictures, as RAM memory has become very much cheaper, many general purpose micros now have high quality graphics. The applications split into three broad areas. Computer aided design, chart drawing, and computer enhanced visuals. Just like this. A very good example of graphic design in computers is a package called AutoCAD and uh, Bill's brought it with him and he's going to show it to us. Now imagine that you have detailed plans of all the parts and components of a complex piece of equipment like the Space Shuttle. If you laid them all out flat, you'd probably cover the runway at Edwards Air Force Base and spend most of the day walking between the drawings you required. With AutoCAD, all the drawings are in the computer and details can be viewed simply by zooming in on the screen using the crosshair cursors to guide the system. We could keep going here until we saw a close-up of one of the screws on the instrument panel. Then, with the aid of light pen, mouse or keyboard, make any changes that we wanted to that drawing or instruct the system to print out a copy of the drawing. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Well, that's computer-aided design. There is another graphic application which is uh, something that computers are very good at, and that's the creation of charts. And that's something that the program that comes with the Sinclair QL, it's called Easel, is also very good at. And uh, Eric's got one lined up for us now. Using Easel, an operator can create quite complex bar charts just by entering simple numerical information from the keyboard. You can see on the top of the screen a help section, a sort of aid memoir to guide you through the system. That's not a permanent feature. It can be removed once you know your way around. It's possible to change the colors of the display at will. Equally easy is changing the style of the display. The touch of a button and the bar chart becomes a graph, still using the same data that was fed in earlier and the program can display that same data in a much tastier way, as a pie chart. Well, you'll often hear the word resolution used in connection with computer graphics. And that simply is the number of dots, horizontally and vertically, that the screen can recognize. The highest most conventional micros can handle is about 800 by 400. The effect of different resolutions really shows up when circles are displayed.
because the low resolution system makes circles look like a series of steps. You can see on this example here. There are even straight lines in that circle. It's not really a circle at all. But in a higher resolution, let's see it, the circle is much more continuous and much more circular. Well, thanks very much, Eric. Well, anyone who works with a lot of figures will find a use for the type of package known as a financial modeler. You teach the system how to manipulate the numbers, which columns to add up and what figures to multiply. And once it knows these relationships, data can be entered and the results automatically calculated. Now, financial modeling was one of the great growth areas made possible by the micro. VisiCalc, the granddaddy of all the micro versions, was said to be responsible for a third of all Apple computers sold in its heyday. Now, things have progressed a long way since then. There are now two main types. The ones like VisiCalc called spreadsheets that rely on cells and the others on English-like logic. Well, now we're going to look at a demonstration of some of Comshare's range of financial packages. The range begins with Planner Calc, which incidentally is recommended by Future Computers, the manufacturers of this FX20. And it's compatible with this Master Planner, which is a cell type and offers an extensive application library of ready-to-use models. It's designed to be a powerful spreadsheet, aimed mainly at the first-time user of such systems, rather than the person who spends his entire time doing financial planning. The system is user-friendly and offers various levels of help to guide you through it. If we look at all the ingredients of one particular financial model, it's almost gobbledygook. But don't be alarmed, the manuals and help levels are designed to take novices through all the stages of building a model. The results are a lot easier to understand. Here we can see part of a spreadsheet. The screen here is a bit like a window through which we can choose to see any small part of the sheet. In fact, we could build this sheet up to the equivalent size of a football pitch and then view it in small handkerchief-sized chunks through the screen. The main function of these spreadsheets is their what-if capability where you can change a value in the middle of a calculation and the system will consider the relationships or rules between the factors involved and give you an answer. Let's say we change the general and administrative costs in this model from £51,000 to £1,000,000 for the fourth quarter of the financial year. Insert the new figures and the system instantly tells you what the change in net income is for the year, a reduction of £520,000. Having done your calculation, this particular program allows you to select any of 25 different formats in which to print out your report from the spreadsheet. Well, that's the master planner based on the spreadsheet. A more sophisticated business package, command-driven this time, is Comshare's Fast Plan 2. Unlike the spreadsheets, where you can, if you choose, see all the stages of calculations, the command-driven system does all its calculations in the privacy of the computer's innards. Here we'll apply to an existing model, taken from the computer's memory, a data file containing all the relevant financial information. You'll be surprised to see both the model and the file are called demo, but never mind. Now having the model and the data merged, we can carry out what-if functions, just like a spreadsheet. But that's not where the real power of this program lies. The real power is in its ability to goal-seek. Now I should explain that normal people like you and me have a fair idea of what goal-seeking means. So quite often computer people refer to this as backward iteration, so as to maintain their mystique. With the data and the model already merged in the computer, we can goal-seek. For example, let's say our closing cash balance of £10,600 is not enough, and we need £12,000 to keep the bank manager happy. Or we can vary different factors to achieve this. One is, of course, the sales volume. Well, to do this, we don't even have to identify the title of our target with any precision. Typing in CLOS is enough to get the system to offer us the nearest it recognises, which is closing cash. Accepting that, we can nominate the £12,000 we wish to end up with and nominate what we want to vary to achieve it. In this case, sales volume.
If we key in S-A-L-E, the system comes back and asks us if we mean sales volume. We say yes and tell the system that we want the sales volume adjusted over all four quarters. The system asks us what accuracy we require and we reply 0.1%, which is closer than I normally shave, but there you are. And off the computer goes to work out the answer, not by working backwards mathematically, but by taking a whole series of figures, aiming high and low, until it homes in on the right one. There's our answer. And if we look forward to the closing cash, it's as we wanted it, £12,000. And in order to end up with the £12,000 balance in closing cash, the system has increased the sales volume by 5%. Accounting requirements have always been high on the list of computing applications. The micro is no exception to that rule. Accounting often seems to be a blanket term for anything in business concerning finance, and it occupies a large area in microcomputing. Systems range from the simple cash book and integrated ledger systems at about £300 or less, to the top modular systems where each ledger is priced at £1,000 or more. I don't think that the most expensive is necessarily the best. Again, like the approach to hardware, shop around, because the range of choice is dazzling. Now, some accounting packages extend their influence and benefits by linking to other systems. On the hardware side, links to electronic tills and barcodes are commonplace. There's always been input from payroll and stock control, but much more is possible. Links to a financial planning package will allow all sorts of projections and forecasts without retyping the data. Links with a database and word processor allow even more possibility. A letter to all people that buy 10,000 widgets per month, for example. We've got part of the BOSS accountancy software package here being demonstrated. In its invoicing mode, just entering a customer's account number and, if required, order number causes the system to fetch the customer statistics from a sales ledger file. Here, if I were a more generous man, seeing the customer has spent £1,040 with me so far this year, I might grant him a discount. One further keystroke brings up all the customer's details, and seeing how much he owes me, I definitely don't want to offer him a discount. Unless any of these details need to be changed for this order, we can proceed to the invoice itself. And here, all that's required to be keyed in is the product code and the quantity. The package does all the rest by referring to the stock file. If the customer wanted 50 desks instead of two, the system would warn me that his order would take him over his particular credit limit. And if the order were for 500 desks, I'd also be warned that my stock level was too low to meet his order. Though I can't think why on earth anyone would want 500 desks. Now, when it comes to the fixed delivery charge, I can intervene with a little common sense and increase his charge to accommodate moving those desks. Now, once the invoice is complete, the system can be instructed to accept it, and the computer will then get on with the drudgery of updating the stock file. At the end of the session, all the data needs to be posted across to the sales ledger, and here the boss program is jolly cunning. It won't let the operator leave the program until such time as the control report print program has been run. Our list of applications ends with database or information retrieval. Now, this type of package allows you to design your own electronic card index system, for example, and capture, process, report, and retrieve all kinds of information. Now, that's another area where the latest developments in design have made using the system easier. When you choose a system, try and make sure that it's not too complex for your needs. Remember, the database is only there to help you in your work. Learning it is not an end in itself. Well, in general, there are three types of systems on the market. There's the keyword system, in which you can home in on a selected shortlist by a continuous process of selection. These may be able to search in free-flowing text and be ideal for libraries. Or, like auto-index here, work with a series of predefined attributes. Now, the general purpose database, while not using keywords, tends to be better at reports and screen design. The Sinclair QL, for example, comes with a package called Archive. Well, Eric, back by popular demand, offers us Archive. By keying in the command Create, Eric has opened up a new file. The program asks us to give the file a name, and showing great imagination, we're going to call it Address. 
The computer now needs to know what sections each entry will have. Now, computer people can't call sections sections, so they call them fields. We can say our first field will be name, the second address, and the third telephone number. And having nominated our fields, we can now tell the program that we've finished creating and get on with the job of filing data. While Eric writes his Christmas card list, it's interesting to note that both Archive and Easel, which we saw earlier, are part of an integrated Sinclair package simply called the QL Programs, which also includes a word processor and a financial modeler, all of which can be made to relate to one another. Having stored away details of most of the blog's family, we can now search the file by telling the computer to find Joe. And there are all the details on Joe displayed on the screen. It's developments like this that could make Eric's little black book quite redundant. Well, thanks very much, Eric. Well, some systems fall between a database and a programming language, like DBase2, for example. These allow an expert to produce a custom design quicker and cheaper than by writing it in a programming language alone. Now, as micro has become more sophisticated, software packages have come on the scene which perform not just one, but many functions. These are called integrated systems, and Lotus 123 is one of them. Bill, nice to see you again, uh, has got just such a system. In fact, Lotus 123 comes with its own tutorial program to guide the operator through the use of the system. Bill's running part of that program now, and it's concerned with the way to integrate the database with the graphics section of the program. Here, the system is prompting Bill through every keystroke and entry to build up his bar chart. It's also teaching him how to achieve the many different types of bar chart representation the system is capable of, both in color and computer green. Thank you, Bill. Well, the main benefit of these packages is the ability to change very quickly from one application to another, taking the data with you. If you want to plot a graph from some results in the spreadsheet, you don't have to retype the numbers. Also, the design of the system is consistent in all application areas. Now, similar to the integrated systems, but catering more for the individual, is the so-called executive aids packages, or executive desktops. Now, as well as some of the applications of the integrated systems, you can have built in some of the things an executive would normally have in manual form, like his diary, his notebook, the telephone index, even a calculator. Here's an example, the open access package by SPI. It's so simple, I can run it myself. We get a window with all the choices in it, and all you have to do is to move the cursor up and down and choose the section of the program you want. Supposing I wanted a word processor, I choose it, press return, and almost instantly the word processing package comes up. If I get confused, or if I'm not quite sure exactly how to operate it, all I have to do is press the help key, and I get advice at any level I want. Well, that's open access. Now, the specialist or vertical market systems cover virtually all fields. These are often developments of custom-built software designed for one specific customer. Now, the best have been written by experts from both camps computer professional, as well as someone with the appropriate specific knowledge. The poor systems have been produced by computer experts who've been simply trying to plug a gap in the market. Information technology, the linking of computers with information, is expected to be the growth industry of tomorrow. Now, there's nothing new about linking micros to mainframes. It's been happening ever since there were micros. But until quite recently, data communications has been the realm of large companies. Most small businesses or home users haven't got a handy mainframe to link to in the first place. Well, now people are using such machines to provide services to micro-users to make the connection worthwhile. Now, this linking process has also been greatly helped by the drop-in price of the required hardware, the modem as it's called. Now, one of the first computerized information and communication services available for general use was the Prestel View Data System, operated by British Telecom with a special adapter or even by a computer. The system provides over 300,000 pages of information, ranging from news and weather to specialized services for farmers, businessmen, travel agents, and of course, home microcomputer owners. Over 94% of people can get Prestel at local telephone rates. 
Now, Prestel's new educational service for schools, launched in January 1985, will allow pupils to get direct experience of the information handling skills that will become increasingly important. Home banking, home shopping and electronic mail are already available and will soon become commonplace. It also provides access to information not easily available elsewhere, such as up-to-date business and government statistics. And schools can send messages to each other through mailbox, a type of electronic pigeonhole. Well, there are a number of specialist services for schools, like course and career guides, an electronic magazine called EdIT, which gives up-to-the-minute news and examples of applications of information technology in schools. And there's School Link, an educational microcomputer section with news, software and hardware reviews and educational computer programs. Schools can download from Prestel and run the programs on their own microcomputers. This is how it looks. This is, in fact, one of a whole encyclopedia of pages on careers guidance. If I had a deep and unremitting interest in botany, for instance, we could key deeper into the system and we could see what sort of careers were available to me. Keying 4 then takes us into a couple of pages which lists the functions, required qualifications and even the job progression of a landscape architect. For the businessman, there's a plethora of financial pages and other business material including city services and stock exchange information, all of which can be easily accessed. Here under the COI section are some pages which refer to new government employment legislation and going deeper into the system, the latest employment statistics. Of course with Prestel you can not only receive data but you can send it as well. Prestel operates a mailbox service for all its subscribers and since the death of the telegram offers the next best thing. Greetings data. Although not all the messages you send need be this unpleasant. Thanks, Chris. Well, Micronet 800 provides a sender service which uses the Prestel database, but for the homeowner and with a Sinclair Spectrum, you can download software to your own home. Now, all businessmen are familiar with the traditional Telex machine and its shortcomings. The Micro can replace the Telex and offer more features at a lower price. For example, there's Braid's Telex Manager, which Jeff will demonstrate. Hello, Jeff. The lower of those two boxes, the one marked Telex Manager, connects the computer to the Telex line. Once connected, the first thing to do is to run the TXMGR program and enter the correct time and date. If you notice, by the way, there are very few vowels in computerese. The message Entering Background Mode appears on the screen and shows us that the computer can now be used for any normal function like word processing. But while that's going on, the computer is prepared to receive messages and store them on disk, and it's completely indistinguishable from any other telex machine attached to the network. Here's how a typical telex is prepared and sent. A built-in word processor, which allows entry of legal telex characters only and limits the line length to 69 characters, facilitates message preparation. Once prepared, the telex is queued for transmission. A previously stored abbreviation, in this case ENCO, allows a commonly used number to be accessed quickly. The Telex queue shows a list of Telexes waiting to be transmitted. If a Telex number is, for example, occupied, the system will retry automatically at regular intervals until the message gets through, which will save a great deal of secretarial time. The system can even be programmed to send messages at night. If we look at a telex sent earlier in the day, we can see the time and date at which the telex was sent and that the answer back was exchanged at the beginning and end of the message, proving that the telex was successfully delivered. Well, that's the computer's version of normal telexing, but there's another facility offered with the Braid system. It's called the Mail Manager. Here's how it works. With the background program already running, the system is ready to send and receive messages via the telephone network to and from mailbox services such as EasyLink or Telecom Gold, or even direct to another microcomputer. 
the computer is attached to the telephone via the upper box, which is known as a modem. We can schedule a session to the EasyLink network to run every morning at 8 a.m. Once scheduled, any message that we queue up will automatically be sent out at 8 a.m., taking advantage of cheap telephone rates and any messages which are pigeonholed for us will automatically be collected. The system can be used to talk to any of the commercial and private electronic mail services. Here's a typical message being prepared for transmission via EasyLink at the next scheduled session. If necessary, it can be sent immediately using the immediate feature. The name of the recipients is entered, in this case, all salesmen, and that's a group we've previously defined to the system, and to the sales director via a single number. Here we can see a queue of messages waiting to be transmitted at the next session. One of the most important features of this product is that incoming mail is automatically collected, getting around the biggest single problem in using mailbox services, and that is people forgetting to look in their pigeonholes. Now, passwords and security are often in the news, and there's another computer buzzword, the hacker. It's the name for a person who logs onto computers illegally and examines data. Hackers have been featured on a number of TV computer programs. They've even been the subject of a film, war games. No system is totally secure, any more than any bank is totally secure or any paper filing system come to that. The irony is that often a doctor who worries about computer passwords with three levels of eight-digit protection has paper records only protected by a single unalarmed window pane. Computer stored data, if treated well, can be a very good friend, but if treated badly, can easily become an enemy. Now, both the floppy disk and that heap of paper contain 600 A4 pages of data. Now, this is the sort of accident that can happen in the best-run offices. You knock your coffee over with your elbow. Now, the floppy disk is completely ruined, destroyed, effectively. The paper is stained, but still readable. You can still just about use it. Now, that's the worst feature of computer data. It's easily damaged. Well, that's the bad news. The good news is that the data on a floppy disk can be copied before coffee, preferably, at a rate of over 600 pages a minute. The copier takes many, many times longer. Now, the answer to the potential disaster of coffee or dust or magnetic fields is to make plenty of backup copies and, with all important data, keep some of it off-site, take it home. Now, a well-run computer system is more secure than any paper outfit. For example, there can't be many businesses with manual ledgers who keep copies off-site and halve the risk of damage by fire. But what about the future? Well, the latest piece of gleaming high-tech on your desk today is tomorrow's electronic antique. And that tomorrow isn't very far off. Most experts reckon a micro's useful life is only five years. Now, that may seem a very short time to the new user, but to the boffins, it seems like centuries. We only have to look back a number of years to realize why. Let's compare the cost and facilities of Sinclair's first pocket calculator with the latest QL computer. In 1974, a typical calculator cost 80 pounds, and at today's prices, that's about 260 pounds. But it had no memory at all. The QL will cost you around 400 pounds, but it has a capacity of 128K. Those remarkable figures speak for themselves, and there's no reason to suppose the speed of development will slow down. But don't be put off. Buy wisely, and the hardware will have paid for itself well before its useful life is over. The hardware will certainly become redundant, but what about the software? And even more important, what about your data? Software is an evolving creation. When it changes, you don't have to throw the old stuff away. But far more important is the portability of your data. The information stored on many computer systems is actually worth more than the whole of the hardware and software put together. Now, that may seem far-fetched, but the input in an accounting system of hundreds of names and addresses and account codes takes many hours. Hours someone's being paid for probably at quite a good rate. The same will apply if you have any large database. Now, here's another bit of jargon to add to your dictionary. You, too, can be a wow at your next dinner party. It's future-proofing. Now, the secret of future-proofing lies in the ability to scrap your hardware as the latest machines come along.
but transfer your software and data. With something like an accounting system with 8 or 16-bit options, if you move up in hardware, it'll probably not look much different. The same files can often be simply copied across. Other systems, even though from the same manufacturer, use the opportunity to enhance the software to suit the increased hardware power. The better systems even provide a program to convert your old data into the new format. Now this gives all the advantages without tedious retyping. So when you're buying software, look for the expansion route. And with databases, make sure there's the means to read in other files and convert them into their own formats. Now we've talked about future proofing, but what sort of future do we need to plan for? The future for micros is exciting. Progress carries on unabated. The trouble is, you might just as well use a crystal ball. Predictions have an irritating knack of turning out to be wrong. Happens all too often. But there are two factors which do seem to be gelling. They're the standardization of operating systems and the standardization of inter-machine communication. With the advent of the micro, there was a great swing away from the mainframe in favor of the new, smaller machines. But as with all pendulums, there was a swing back. People realized that total centralization was not the solution, but then neither was total decentralization. So which way will the pendulum swing? The answer is it'll stay more or less in the middle. Some tasks will be better performed locally, others will rely on access with big central databases. In fact, the big manufacturers have that very much in mind for their next product ranges. The plan is, like the latest in Hi-Fi, to get everything into one system. Not only keyboard, screen and processor, but communications both with the telephone system and networks and even telex. Now, one of the great surprises of the industry has been the new dominance of the standard operating system. In the early days, the PET, Apple and Tandy machines were the success stories and they all had their own operating systems. The only machines of the time using CPM, as it's called, such as the North Star, had relatively small sales. But sales of CPM-based machines expanded, leading to success stories like the well-known Sirius. Now we're on the MS-DOS bandwagon. It's another operating system. The sales of machines that can run MS-DOS and PC-DOS, as they're called, are probably greater than all other single-user computers put together. But what's next? One thing we can be certain of is getting better value for money. You might think that computers would get cheaper and certainly some do, but the interesting fact is that people seem to want to pay the same amount. They just get more power for the same money. The majority of micros today are more powerful than ever, but they're very similar in design and facilities to their predecessors. However, one or two such as Apple's Macintosh are breaking new ground. The key to the success of a machine is its software range, and as yet, there are only a few packages for the Mac compared with those for CPM and MS-DOS, but it looks as if that's changing. There are things that Mac does that very few others at anywhere near the price can match. Voice recognition is still in its infancy, especially at the price office micro users are willing to pay. Now there's one job which more powerful computers have been able to do for a long time and now can be done by a desktop setup. It's called multitasking. It's the ability to run more than one program or task from the same terminal and view on the screen each one at the press of a button. It relies on a system called, I'm sorry about this, concurrent CPM or CCPM, as the people who like the jargon like to call it. It's a little bit like your TV. All four channels are running at the same time, and you choose which to view. Now, let's show that. Here's Bill with an example of CCPM. Here, Bill is running four programs on the future computer at once, and can switch into whichever program he needs according to the interruptions in his office. For example, the first program is word processing. The second, a link to his mainframe. The third is a list of programs on his disk. And the fourth is his telephone database. He can switch between each console, as a screen is called, with a single keystroke. A development of that is networking, which takes several multitasking computers and links them together so that a group of users can share common data or expensive resources, for example, hard disks or printers. Networking avoids one of the shortcomings of the multi-user computer, which is if the central processor goes down, all users are stopped. A machine failing on the network doesn't stop other users continuing their work. 
Networking on the future computer also allows for expansion. Up to 255 computers can be linked. Applications like electronic mail become as easy as this. All these computers are on the same network. All that connects them is just a very simple wire, similar to a telephone wire with a simple British Telecom connector on the end. So let's see the network in action. While Bill is doing a hundred lines for showing off in the concurrent CPM demonstration, John can send him a message. A bleep from the computer and a flashing light on the keyboard tells Bill of the message waiting. A keystroke and it's on the screen. The question we've all been asking, is Bill there? Uh, software is becoming more helpful in response to user demands made possible by the more powerful hardware. An example is the smart system from Paradigm or the Windows systems we've already seen with open access. Well, that's just a glimpse of some of the computer systems which will become popular over the next few years. For the present, for anyone on the brink of computerization, the message, I hope, is clear. Come on in. The water's fine. But watch out for the sharks. Goodbye.